as Gary said, we're located in uh, southeast Nebraska, actually Richmond County, which is the most southeast county in the state. Uh, farm in a variety of uh, topography from hills to uh, bottoms and uh, soil types from sand to heavy clay. Uh, the, the goal of our project was to accurately measure the remaining nitrogen needs of corn in season and produce a variable rate uh, prescription, nitrogen prescription that could be flown on with a plane uh, to address those needs. Uh, there are multiple challenges in determining how much nitrogen to supply for each acre of corn. Overall growing conditions can vary from year to year, and I should mention we're dry land, so uh, if it rains uh, or doesn't rain is a very important factor in, in what kind of yields we can raise. Um, in addition to the yield potential within the field, uh, you can see things from uh, the topography, soil types, fertility, and rainfall are all going to uh, play a factor in addition to what the weather is overall. The weather can also affect uh, the nitrogen availability that's in the soil. How much of the nitrogen can be gained from uh, organic matter mineralization, but we also have to be concerned about the amount of uh, losses that can occur in wetter conditions and also due to our coarser textured soil. The red and orange dots on this map represent wells with high nitrate levels. For the environment and our own health, we need to be managing our nitrogen with the goal to not only, to, to only apply what the crop will use. We felt by waiting until the initial application of pre-plant nitrogen was nearly depleted, the growing conditions that have occurred up to that point can be taken into account to help calculate the remaining nitrogen that will be needed. By waiting until that initial application is nearly depleted, the growing conditions can actually be experienced in season and factored in to calculate remaining nitrogen needed. These next six slides give a brief overview of our project. In dryland corn production, there's two application choices, ground or air. Okay. One consistent advantage of the air over ground is no crop damage due to stand loss uh, from the wheel tracks. Also, if the field is too wet for ground applicators, a, a plane can get the job done. This project wouldn't have succeeded without a team effort. I provided the experience for field operations. Nathan and Laura Thompson provided all the technical knowledge and skills to set up the plots, uh, program and fly the drone, analyze the data, and also write the prescriptions for the nitrogen application that would be made later. We used, I guess I should have mentioned, uh, in this slide I'm um, applying various rates of nitrogen in the different strips that we set up, and that'll be explained shortly. We used a GPS auto steer to be able to plant on the anhydrous strips. This allowed us to uh, make sure each seed had equal access to the nitrogen in each of the nitrogen rate strips. The entire plots were flown weekly to measure the nitrogen status in the crop. When the drone imagery was, uh, started to show that the corn was running out of nitrogen, GPS referenced prescription maps were generated and sent to the aerial applicator. Besides the cart scale weights of grain harvested out of the center passes of each of the strips, the combine also recorded yield data from the entire plot. Nate will now provide some in-depth look at the drone imagery that went into our project. Okay. So, um, 
the whole goal of this project was use a, a multi-spectral sensor to, in, a, in effect, um, measure the amount of nitrogen in the corn plant. So um, in the past, um, nitrogen, I don't know if, how familiar people are, are with uh, like chlorophyll meters or a SPAD sensor or something like that. But in the past, they were um, you know, usually handheld or um, mounted on some equipment that you would then drive through the field. Well, um, now with the advent of advanced technology, they've become a lot smaller, and now you can mount them on um, things like um, drones or airplanes or things like that. So um, you avoid a lot of the problems, like Dean was saying, with uh, um, driving through the field and creating you know, crop damage or, or not having good conditions for things like that. Um, so, and it's, it's cheaper to fly the drone than it is to, to um, you know, get a big, big piece of equipment through the field, and it's easier, not invasive, more frequent. Um, so what we're looking at is, like I said, we're, we're directly measuring the nitrogen content of the corn plant, and that's done sort of indirectly. We, we, um, we look at five different wave bands, but what we're really concerned with, or the important one, is the red band. The red band directly relates to chlorophyll content, which then you can relate to nitrogen content. Um, and we, we take the red, the, the information we get from the red band, and we make some indices. There's, uh, maybe you've heard of them. Um, NDVI is a really popular one. It's just a way of relating um, different indices into just a, a, an easy to understand ratio. Um, the one we used, and I'll explain it a little later, but we used NDRE. And um, the reason we used NDRE is because uh, the red edge area, and you can kind of see with this this graph here, the red the red edge band is more responsive to um, slight changes in in the nitrogen content of a corn plant. Um, and what happens is, as the corn plant gets grows and it gets greener, um, the NDVI um, index begins to saturate. So this is an example of a comparison of two indices. Um, on the top is NDVI, and the bottom is NDRE. This is, this is the same, same flight, this is the exact same time, and you can tell that the NDVI has saturated, where you can't see any, <coughs> hardly any differentiation. This is a, this is a nitrogen plot um, of different nitrogen rates, but you can see on the NDRE um, the differences uh, the differences start to show up. You can see the, the different nitrogen rates within that, within the plot there. So where it's red, that means it's less nitrogen? Yeah, where it's red, it's less nitrogen, less chlorophyll, uh, less red band reflectance. Um, <clears throat> so in order to understand if a corn plant really is deficient in nitrogen, you need to have um, a reference point of a corn plant that is not deficient. So when, when we set up these studies or we do these prescriptions, we always have an area of the field um, that's a small area, but it's more or less over-applied, over-applied nitrogen. So we know that that corn there is fully sufficient in nitrogen. That way we have something to compare to. And when we compare those, the, the fully sufficient corn to our target area, we create something called a, a, a sufficiency index. So this is an example. This is a, a field where you can tell that the, it's visually apparent just with our naked eye that that corn there is deficient in nitrogen, whereas, say, the corn there on the left is, is fully sufficient, has all the nitrogen, nitrogen it needs. So what we do is we, we'll measure this all. We'll fly the drone over it. We'll get uh, a, an index number for the sufficient plant. We'll get an index number for the deficient plant, and then we just make a ratio. We, do, we divide the, the insufficient plant um, by the sufficient, 
and then we come up with our sufficiency index. And that's kind of the key to creating the, the, our prescriptions and, and relating you know, what we know is to be sufficient to our target area, which may or may not be. So um, when we first started this project, we had some choices to make as far as drones. There's, there's lots there on the market. Um, we went with a, a DJI Inspire 2. It's a, um, actually built and intended for filmmaking. It's, it's meant to be um, a videography drone, more or less. They make all kinds of fancy video cameras for it. Um, we chose it because of its uh, combination of price and, and features. Uh, flight time of about 25 minutes on average in perfect conditions. Um, Going to fly up to 58 miles per hour, which it really isn't important for us. Um, important detail here is that it has some payload capacity um, at about a pound and a half, which is more than enough for our sensor. Um, it has it can fly in winds up to 22 miles an hour, which means it can compensate. It can keep itself in the air which is important because, um, you know, in late June, early July in Nebraska, it can be windy sometimes and, and we don't want to be kept out of the field just because it might be beautiful sunny skies, but if the wind's blowing, we want to still be able to fly. Um, it's got its own built-in GPS. It can navigate itself. Um, it's got two batteries and it costs about $3,000. Um, the sensor, there's also many, many different choices out there on the market. Um, so the one we went with is, is made by a company called Micasense. Um, they're red end sensor. It's since it's, as far as their lineup, it's, it's an older model now. They've, these things are continuously changing and improving. But um, it's a five band multispectral sensor. Um, it senses in the blue, green, red, red edge, and near infrared. Um, Pretty light, five five ounces or so, small size. Um, eight centimeters per pixel ground sample distance. What that means is that at 400 foot altitude, which is the FAA limit, um, each pixel on the picture that it takes represents eight centimeters on the ground. So um, about two and a half, three inches. Um, makes one capture per second. And it also includes, and this is important as well, it includes a downwelling light sensor and its own external GPS. So it doesn't share any information with the drone, which has its own GPS. It has its own um, connected GPS system and a downwelling light sensor. So the importance of the sensor, um, you know, we want to be able to compare our imagery across time, especially for a research project like this. We want to be able to uh, take a picture on Monday and go back the next Monday and take more pictures and be able to directly compare those two. Even though the first day it might have been overcast and the second day it may have been bright sunny. Because um, again, this is measuring reflectance. And so reflectance is going to depend on how much light you have. So we want to be able to correct for our light conditions more or less. So this sensor comes with a downwelling light sensor that measures those ambient light conditions. Um, every picture it takes, it records also all the, the just the, you know, the, the amount of light that's coming in just from the sun and the sky or, or whatever. Um, and before every, every flight, we have, to, uh, we have to calibrate it. I should have brought it as an example, but there's a picture here. It's a, there's a, we have a reflectance panel. It has a little squ a square about this size and it's painted um, a special color that's been accurately measured in a lab and we know exactly what that reflectance is. So when we, before we take, start a flight, we'll take a picture of that um, with the drone. We'll, hold, we'll pick the drone up and it's kind of cumbersome if you're doing it by yourself. Um, so you pick the drone up and you hold it over here and then on your smartphone you can control the camera and then you take a picture and then it's taking information from the, the light sensor and everything. And, and so then when we go in to process it, we go in and we, we tell the computer what the values are of that panel. And it corrects all our imagery based on that panel and the, um, the information from the sensor. 
<clears throat> um, so we we fly passes back and forth across the field, um, and it'd be impossible to do that by hand. So we use software <coughs> um, to control the drone and plan the missions and, and draw it. We, it's really simple. It's on an iPad or, or your phone or any smartphone or iPad can can do it. Um, it's a program maybe you've heard of. It, it's called Drone Deploy, and uh, it's pretty simple. It's pretty amazing, really, how, how it just you you plan out your mission, and you you tell it um, how high you want it to go, what your overlap is, um, which is another thing we we shoot for seventy five percent overlap. Um, it just helps. It stitches better, um, it makes a complete better, more complete map. Um, so you can set all that information up and you hit a button and it just takes off and does its thing, flies the mission and, and then comes back. All on its own. You don't have to don't have to do anything. So um, there are some legal considerations when you're getting into flying drones. Um, it's all for commercial purposes like what we'd be doing. It's all um, under part 107 rules of FAA. Um, if it's greater than 0.55 pounds, it has to be registered, um, just like a plane. We, we have a registration number, and, and we have to have it on the drone, um, just like a tail number on an airplane. Commercial use, you, you need a, a remote pilot certificate. It's kind of like a pilot's license. It's not quite as uh, in-depth as, as like a manned aircraft, but it requires some study and some time. Um, there's a, some restrictions, we have to stay below 400 foot above ground level. It has to be within line of sight at all times. And you can't fly it at night. And the line of sight is important. It's unaided line of sight, so you can't use it binoculars. Um, these drones are able, I think, the max transmission range for the controller is like four miles. Well, there's no way you can see this four miles away up in the air. So um, you have to be able to see it at all times with no binoculars or unaided in any site. Um, it's always important to check VFR maps, make sure you're not in any restricted airspaces. There's a website you can use to do that. Um, like I said, there's lots of mission planning apps and, and programs. We use Drone Deploy. That's free and it's, it's easy to use. Uh, set for 400 foot, 75% overlap. Uh, wind conditions, ideally less than 20 miles an hour. Um, that's that's what the drone rated at. It probably could do better, but um, I wouldn't ever try it. Light conditions are, are important. It does have a, that light sensor is there to con compensate for changing light conditions, but what it can't do is it can't handle like partly cloudy conditions where you have big puffy clouds and, and shadows moving across the field. It can't quite compensate for that. So you want uniform cloud conditions. You want either completely completely sunny or just, you know, some high clouds that are kind of opaque or, or just complete overcast. But the big puffy clouds don't really work very well. Um, time of day. A couple hours of solar noon. Um, it's not so much of a an issue in the summer probably because uh, there's quite a bit of time where the sun's fairly close to being directly overhead, but that's simply just to uh, limit shadows, the effect of shadows. Even on a, in a cornfield, there's a you can get a shadow effect from row to row, or um, you really notice it if there's any trees along the field, the shadows will cast over the field and that'll throw your imagery off. So you really want to be close to solar noon, uh, and limit the shadows, and then you got the most direct straight on light. Um, and this was a challenge this year in our county. Um, Richardson County was awfully dry. Um, if you waited too long into the day, the leaves would start to roll because of the plant was conserving moisture. Um, well, you can't, you can't sense the leaves. You can't measure the chlorophyll content when the leaves all rolled up. So you got to be cognizant of that. So well, the final challenge is with flying, well, not the final one, but another one. There's, there's quite a few. Um, data storage. So if you fly at 400 foot, which is the most efficient altitude, 70% um, overlap, 
which is probably a little, little less than what we normally do. An 80 acre field is going to have 13 and a half gigabytes of data. It's almost 6,000 images. So um, we were doing this like once a week for each one of these fields, and, and it, it added up. Um, we have, we have terabytes of data at home. So this is the output. This is what you get. Um, each, each row here going across is one capture. So if you notice, they, they, let's see. each row going across is one capture. So there's four captures here. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you can see back where you are here on the screen, but you can tell it's moving, the drone is moving this way. And so this is, this is in time, this is the next one, the next one, the next one. And this is, so this is the output you get. And they're all black and white because what they're doing is they're just <coughs> measuring the reflectance for each given band. So the blue isn't actually blue on the, on the image that you get. It's just each pixel is a value representing the reflectance. When we, when we take it into the computer, the computer then assigns blue to blue and green to green and red to red, and then you get a color image like what you, you would see if you're flying with the drill. Um, but every image is geotagged, and then we stitch it together with image processing software. Um, the software we used last year was Pix4D, um, which is specially designed and made for this. Um, the year before, we used software that was made by Micasense, and this coming year, it'll probably be a different software because it's constantly changing. It, and in fact, Pix4D um, changed right in the middle of the growing season last year, and we kind of scramble and find an alternative. Um, it's pretty uh, computer intensive. Um, it's about six minutes per acre, so on average. So it can, there are some fields that take a couple hours. To, to, it's just the computer sits there and chugs through it. Um, after we get a stitched image, then we can, it'll stitch each band individually, and then we can use, use those to calculate our, our uh, indices, NDRE or NDVI or whatever, what have you. So when we have, once we have our indices and our stitched images, we can then overlay those in GIS software. Um, we use software called QGIS. It's free on the internet. It's kind of similar to ArcMap if anyone's ever used that. Um, we can overlay all those imagery, you know, calculator index, and then we combine it with uh, calculator <laughs> SI. We combine it with the base rate of N, well, organic matter, previous crop credits. So if you had soybeans before, um, we give ourselves a nitrogen credit for that, and then we consider a yield goal. And those all go into the equation that generate a prescription. So, first location, in 2017 we had one. Um, this was the plot layout. We had three uh, base rate, well, four base rates, three that we were testing. Uh, we had two drone management rates of 75 pounds and, and 100 pounds base rate as in hydrous ammonia. And then we had the traditional farmer management was 160 pounds base. And then we also had two high-end reference blocks, uh, 225 pounds. Might mention the size or the acreage that was included. How many acres that covered? This plot was about 90 acres. Um, each reference block, I think, was 300 foot long of, of one pass. Wide. 300, 300 feet wide. Yeah. It was okay. <clears throat> so small little, I don't know, a couple acres probably for each high reference block. and. 30 acres each for each treatment. We flew it about 11 times. Um, we flew it quite a bit because we, what we were looking for is we were looking for that moment where the lower, lower base rate strips started to show deficiency when compared to the references. We really weren't sure when exactly that was going to happen, so we, we flew it quite often. Um, June 24th is apparently the day. That, and you can tell this is these are just the same 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 flight same data. This is an RGB view, so true color view, and this is the NDRE view. And you can see where the 75 pound rates really started to show up. Really a lot uh, yellower and redder, meaning lower nitrogen content. So 
what was happening here is these base rates were starting to run out of nitrogen. The corn was showing deficiency. And that's something we could see with the NDRA and we couldn't see in the, in the true color. That was, it's, it's a combination of the red, green, and blue band. So it's a true color. It's, yeah, here. This is um, just a, a, an actual plain old photo from a, just a digital camera Com on the same, you know, probably within a couple days. I don't know if it was the same day compared to NDRE. So you can see, I mean, what your eyes see, it all looks the same. But the, the index is showing the deficiency. So when we took the imagery and then all those factors I mentioned before, like organic matter and yield goal and, and end credits and everything, this is a um, prescription we came up with. It was a variable rate prescription um, for an airplane. It was a, we, uh, 200 foot long blocks because when the airplane flies around, flies down the, the path, that's how far they, tr they, they can change a rate every one second. They go about 200 foot in one second. So that limited our block size. Uh, so the, the variable rate prescription ranged from 60 to 120 pounds of urea, um, of N as urea. The farmer rate, the farmer decided he was going to put on an extra 40 pounds on his rate, on his, on his managed strips. So 24th is the imagery we used to apply. And then the 14th was a couple weeks later after application. The application, I think, was like two days, three, three the 28th. So a couple days later, we applied. A couple weeks later, we flew it again to see what happened. And you can see that everything was more uniform. It appears that the, the lower rate strips caught up, so to speak. Everything's more uniform and homogenous. So there was apparently a response to the fertilizer we applied with the plane. We did. I don't remember what it was. I, think we recorded that, didn't we? I don't think we recorded it. We recorded that in eighteen. We we tried we tried to time the application to go right before that rain, so it's not just sitting there and and losing it all. So we wanted to get watered in. The urea that did go on was had a stabilizer on it, so we did have a little more time. Uh, to hopefully get a rain. Yeah. 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 It was coated or yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a this is a statistical analysis of the, the NDRE response. So you can see these are graphs representing oops representing the reflectance on the 24th of June. These letters here represent that there's a statistical difference between the, the three treatments. Um, this is a graph of the values on the 14th of July. This gray line here is the reference box, um, if you're wondering. And then again on 14th of September. So you can see they overall they decline. Um, they're probably the greenest right before tassel in late June. And then as the, the crop matures and then dries down, they obviously decline. But they stayed pretty uniform for the rest of the year. Um, here's a table showing um, our base rates, average in-season rate from the prescription or the airplane, and then the total end rates for, for all three treatments. Um, this is the yield. The yield was the, s the same across all three treatments. Um, so then since we used less nitrogen on the drone treatments, there was obviously some efficiency gain in, in pounds of N per bushels of grain produced. And these are really good, pretty good efficiency numbers. And then a, a partial product or a partial profit calculation, and they're all fairly similar in, in profitability. Um, it is more expensive to apply urea with a variable rate airplane than it is to um, put it on as an hydrus. So that's why, even though we saved about twenty-five pounds on average, the profitability calculations came out pretty much even. Dean's going to go through the our two 2018 here fields. Yeah. In uh, 2018, we continued the project on two new fields. Uh, Bayo Yezel and a neighboring farmer had agreed to be part of the grant project and provided us with a field for testing. 
we reduced our drone management uh, tree plant rates from two to one. Uh, we chose to go with a 100 pound base rate for the drone managed fields since it carried us further into the growing season and allowed us to take into account more of the growth factors that had occurred up until that point. This uh, north field uh, site was on gently sloping upland. <clears throat> we did uh, frequent flights through June as we had the year before to watch for signs, for the first signs of any nitrogen shortage before any permanent yield uh, reduction could, be, could occur. Because of uh, drier soil moisture profile and lower than normal rainfall in 18, the nitrogen level differences between the strips weren't as obvious as in 17. On June 27th, uh, after flying the field uh, with the drone, we'd made prescription maps and <clears throat> sent them to the aerial applicator. Because of the uniformity of the drone imagery for the field, we were able to have the plane apply a flat rate of 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Also note uh, the rainfall that we received on the 30th of June. Here's a comparison of the drone imagery just before fertilizing and then a week and a half later. The improvement is subtle compared to the 2017 imagery. The drone likely made the drought likely made the moisture a bigger yield limiting factor than the fertilizer. And to summarize uh, this field, we started with uh, the 100 pounds for the drone based and then applied 25 pounds for a total of 125. The farmer uh, managed strips had 160 pounds applied free plant. The yields came out uh, very close to the same, uh, insignificantly uh, different statistically. The thing that was uh, statistically different was the improvement in efficiency of nitrogen on the drone strips. To get the NUE uh, number, you basically just divide the pounds of nitrogen used excuse me, by the uh, eight bushels of corn that you harvest. The profit per acre was slightly lower for the drone strips, although it wasn't statistically different. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, this in 18, the farmer strips didn't get any additional nitrogen as they had in, in 17. Uh, this is the layout for the south side. It was a bottom field, but experienced less rainfall than the north site using the same uh, two uh, pre-plant in rates. Well, excuse me, I should say uh, the, the drone rate was still the 100 pounds. The farmer rate in this case was 180 pounds base rate. We used the same uh, flight uh, times for this field also. As we noted earlier, there was only minor differences uh, seen in the drone versus farmer strips in 2018. And again, again, because of the uniformity of the drone imagery for the field, we were able to have the plane apply a flat rate. In this case, uh, the calculations indicated that we could get by with uh, 53 pounds of nitrogen on the drone strips. And also uh, note that uh, the rainfall following uh, this flight was in this location was uh, considerably less. Here's the imagery uh, before and after fertilizing showing only minor differences. Uh, something to note, we continued flying the field uh, on a slightly less frequent uh, basis, but uh, later in the summer, a little over uh, a month later on August 9th, here's some imagery that uh, we captured. I think this really starts to show that under drought conditions, uh, the different soil types and water holding capacities of this field uh, had significant impact on the plant health of the crop. The accuracy of the drone imagery is very impressive, especially when you compare it to 
the combine yield monitor uh, data that we harvest that we gathered in October of harvesting the crop. So to summarize this field, uh, the drone imagery uh, received uh, the drone imagery strips received 153 pounds of nitrogen. The farmer strips 180. The yields came out uh, basically the same within a fraction of a bushel of each other. Uh, again, we saw a slight improvement in the efficiency of nitrogen in the drone strips versus the farmer strips. And uh, res this resulted in an insignificant but slightly lower profit because the farmer strips weren't side dressed due to the drought. The costs for materials and application are listed below. <clears throat> this is a picture from one of two field days that we held in 17 and 18. A later slide that uh, will come up will list the web link to a YouTube video of the entire field day. At that point, I think I'll let Nate summarize what we've uh, seen over this two-year project. Okay. So in summary, uh, we saved nitrogen for all three sites, uh, average, you know, on average 30 pounds an acre, 25 to 35 pounds. Um, there's no yield loss at any site or year. In, in all years, the drone plus the sensor approach uh, produced greater nitrogen efficiency. So we used less, less pounds of N to produce uh, a single bushel of grain. Um, the profitability is fairly similar. Um, like Dean said, in 2018, the, it was affected um, by the fact that the farmer chose not to apply side dress. Um, if we weren't in a, in a research situation where we were testing a method, we probably would have made the decision to not to apply in the drone managed strips either, but we really wanted to test the response to the fertilizer based on what the drone was saying. We really wanted to see what was going to happen, so we did it anyways. If we were really in a more practical, real-life situation, we probably wouldn't have applied. And then um, the drone imagery in that case probably would have been used to confirm the farmer's intuition that it was too dry, that we hadn't really lost any nitrogen, and so there was no need to apply any more, any more in. So, yeah, low rainfall in those two, in both years, actually. Um, one of the big challenges was timing that nitrogen application to coincide with rainfall. Um, because if you, if you fly it on and it doesn't rain for a week, well, you've, you've lost a lot, of, a lot of your end. And that's going to affect your efficiency. So we, we would like to really see how this works in, in a supposed wet or normal year. Um, some future ideas we're, we're thinking about is um, this would probably work fairly well in, in a center pivot environment where you have the ability to fertigate so you don't have to worry about timing your nitrogen correctly with, with rainfall. Um, and even going beyond the drone, but even just putting the sensor on the pivot itself is something you can do. Uh, if we're non-irrigated, um, we're looking at, you know, obviously lowering, lowering the base rate, um, the starting rate, so we can better time um, our applications for, for when the plant needs it or when we think we're more likely to get rain. Um, there also, the other option is you could use a higher base rate closer to what you think you may need and, and then monitor with the drone to see if, if you have any loss events that require maybe some spot applications or, or something like that. Um, so this is, this is something where I think we're going to be trying next year is do it on more of a contour area, having um, different high rate blocks throughout the field will fly and just observe, maybe not necessarily use it to apply nitrogen, but just observe how things change and then compare yield and, and try to find out where the optimum um, nitrogen rates are gonna be. And, and possibly in addition to high rates, also have some small low rate blocks so you get a, a early warning that you're approaching the, the end of the nitrogen available. Right, using those low areas is kind of like a litmus test for 
um, timing your, your nitrogen application. So, any questions? He was asking if we, if we, um, uh, if we took into account the cost of, of the labor and time and, and materials of flying the drone into our profitability calculations, and we did not. Um, we, were, we, we just don't have a good handle on exactly how much that would cost. I mean, we were flying it so much more often than what you would in, a, in a, I guess, a real life application. Um, you know, estimates are probably two to five dollars an acre is probably what it would cost. Um, but the problem with um, a lot of our time on it is similar whether you're flying a 40 acre field or you're flying a 100 acre field the cost of it is really kind of the same, so it's kind of hard to put a per acre cost on it, so. In perfect conditions, you can do 80 acres with this, this setup. Now, I mean, there's other drones out there that'll, like a fixed wing will probably, he, he was asking if we, how, how much time we'd get out, or how many acres we get out of a flight. So it's about 80 acres in perfect conditions. So other setups can do longer. Um, so, so okay, are you, you're asking if you can use prior year's data to kind of predict when... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the thing about this is what you're, what we're kind of doing here is we're in our, our nitrogen equation. We're taking into account the weather, so that crop is going to show deficiency at different times, mostly based on the weather. Right. That's it. Yeah, I mean, we've thought about that, but we're really not sure how we would approach approach how to exactly go about that. I mean, it's no, been thought of. Yeah, yeah. Have this, yeah. And and actually, with this this here, kind of one of the goals of this is is kind of what you said. Um, one, you know, they, there's there's been a thought where you do something called a nitrogen ramp. Where you apply different base rates, and then you compare it to yield, and then you, you chart it, and then you can find where that where that graph kind of tops out, and and determine your your optimum or most efficient end rate. So I don't know if that's kind of what you're. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a cool idea. I mean, that would be more um, requires. Yeah. Um, my other question would be, so, I mean, you said the plane just did a flat rate the past couple of years. It can actually vary the crop test if it's a plane. Yeah. In, in 2018, we had the plane fly flat rates because the imagery didn't show enough difference to justify doing a variable rate. In 17, they did fly variable rate, uh, and it ranged from, what, uh, 60 to 60 like 120. To 120 pounds, so it varied a lot. The imagery suggested that we could efficiently place nitrogen at those different rates through the, along those trips. It was almost a quarter mile long trips uh, in the 17 uh, project. <laughs>